Welcome to Planning for the Future, the podcast. Welcome to the show. We're sitting here with Martha Jo Patterson. She is an elder law attorney out of California. Welcome to the show, Martha. Thanks. So it is a strange time out there right now with COVID-19 and the shelter in place orders that are going around right now. How does someone like you deal with that? Um, you know, I, I'm trying to be, you know, prudent and wise. Um, I'm, even though I'm in the, you know, over 60 category, I'm basically healthy. I joke, I never get anything. So, um, I'm, you know, doing shopping and stuff for other people and, you know, getting out. Um, I'm actually still available to clients. We've been meeting mostly by telephone and by Zoom. And I think actually, you know, as we get started, I think we're going to continue doing, um, you know, limiting our physical contact signings in California. We have to do that in person. The notary has to see you sign. Uh, you know, they have to get your signature in their notary journal. So those we've been doing uh, in person uh, with masks and new pins and um, kind of, you know, limiting our contact, you know, staying about six feet apart. I'm not sure it's exactly six feet around my table in the conference room, but you know, keeping apart, making sure people are, are well. Uh, I've done one signing outdoors um, so we could have more distance and, the uh, natural air would clear out the virus and not have it, you know, if it was existing in their house. So, and some people are doing signings at, you know, uh, people's cars back and forth. So whatever feels uh, safe to you will do uh, to get that signing done and, you know, making technology be our friend instead of our enemies. So. That's great. Yeah. 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 Technology right now, is uh, really becoming everybody's friend. And when it comes to the the estate planning and uh, elder care law, now is a great time to really look into this. If you have not got any planning done or you need some advice or you need an elder care attorney, now is a great time because you have that time to focus on things. There's no need to put something off anymore. And you can help them get everything started and get the balls rolling and, and, and get everything set up, correct? I can. And you know, really, you talk about not waiting to too long. I got a call last week, and I'm you know, not saying this because I'm on this radio. It really happened. You know, somebody wanted to plan for her brother. You know, he had been ill. Um, we don't. You know, he didn't test positive for the virus, but he was getting more and more ill. And she called in and said, you know, he wants to do his estate plan. Um, by the time, you know, she called me, um, got the information to me, all of which was over two days. Um, when I called her and said, okay, you know, can we arrange to, you know, meet with your brother? Um, he was in the hospital. We couldn't get in to see him. We couldn't get him to sign. And when we you know, when I called the nurses to try and arrange something and he wasn't communicating anymore. So, you know, he waited too long and I couldn't help him. And I, I, I don't like that call. I mean, you know, it's like sad, you know, we'll end up in a probate court and in California. You want to avoid that. It gets pretty expensive. Uh, you know, don't wait until you're that, that person going in. And frankly, for healthcare documents, if you don't have a healthcare directive, you know, the hospital can't discuss your private healthcare information with your relatives without an advanced directive naming who they can talk to. You know, they really can't give you much information over the phone. You know, right. HIPAA is one of those laws that I don't like a whole lot because it makes it too private. It is protective. Yeah. And we want to be protective, but you know, there is, there is times that, uh, you know, it does get in the way. Now you mentioned probate. Probate seems to be the dirtiest word ever, but it's easily avoided, right? It is easily avoided. You know, your traditional living trust, most people have heard about them by now in California. Those are designed to avoid probate, and they do provide it. You do one thing. So my, you know, when I was doing live seminars and on my online seminars, I remind people that a trust works like a wagon. If you have a wagon and it doesn't have any toys in it, it, you know, rolls around and it's a great looking wagon. 
but you have to put your assets into your trust or they go through probate. If an asset is in my name, if it says Martha Jo Patterson on it, and it doesn't say Martha Jo Patterson as trustee of Martha's trust, then it's not in my trust. So you have to actually put your assets in your wagon. I know that sounds silly, and I literally have people calling me because they've got a trust and they don't think their house is in their trust. It's not in their wagon, and that's literally what they'll say. You know, I didn't get my trust in my wagon. I know it's not there. Well, we need to make sure or else I have to go to probate court and say to the judge, they did this trust and they want their house in their trust. So I'm still in probate court and I'm still charging a fee. And it may be less than a probate fee, but it's still going to be, you know, it's going to be more than I'm going to charge you to do your trust. So, you know, you want to get your assets into your trust. And if you went online, they didn't tell you that. If you went to a paralegal, they probably didn't tell you that either. They may not know that. I've heard, uh, I've heard an attorney tell me that uh, probate is not the worst thing in the world, uh, but the only people that win when it comes to probate is the attorney because they get paid either way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, I, I love, I personally love probate court. I always get paid. Uh, if it's a true probate, my fees are, are set out by statute. They're you know pretty substantial. You know, uh, you know, a three hundred thousand dollar house is going to give me twelve thousand dollars. You know, that's a pretty nice fee, and you know, it's kind of follow the, you know, go through the process. It takes about a year for me to get paid, a year and a half maybe if there's complications longer. If there's fighting families, I'm going to get paid that guaranteed, and I may get paid more if I do a, a lot enough extra work to convince the judge to give me more money. But I'm guaranteed a certain amount of money. It's pretty nice. Sure, absolutely. And it, so to avoid probate, you just need to have those. It's basically just a couple of uh, pieces of paper signed, right? A couple of documents, and that's all you need to do to avoid the probate. Yeah, print, well, you know, they're, like I said, you know, because you have to make sure all your assets are in your trust to avoid probate, there is more than just a couple of documents. You know, people think that, and people think it's just the documents. And there's probably, I don't know, you know, four or five different versions of, you know, living trusts that you can get online and fill in yourself. Okay. And that's great. And you avoid probate. Unfortunately, the mistakes you can make in filling out those documents, there's, you know, a lot of mistakes you can make. But some of the ones that are made more commonly is, you know, suggest, you know, you name your oldest child. Well, your oldest child might not be trustworthy. I had a case years ago where the oldest child was named uh, because it literally said in the, at that time, it was a fill in the blank form she'd gotten from the stationery store. And it said, you know, you suggested naming your oldest child. She did. He was in prison um, for drug dealing. You know, um, not exactly who he wanted to, and he served as executor and drove everybody crazy. So, um, because the court actually let him because she had named him. So, you kind of need to be careful. Now, that's a silly mistake, but that's the kind of mistake people make. They, you know, they don't name all their kids. There's all sorts of mistakes. Right. I've heard that it's almost, you know, when you're when you're doing that, when you're setting your plan together, you want to make sure that you have your team set correctly. Like say you do have three kids, you, you, you want one to have that sort of, you know, that power. Um, so they, they can go through and sign checks if they need to, things like that. But you want that to be the responsible one. That might not be the oldest one. That might be the middle one. The And then the youngest one might be one that's a little better with organization. So they might be in charge of something. And then that oldest one might be a little loosey goosey that you just want them to, you know, give them some errands on the side. You don't really want them to be uh, a main person when it comes to putting their team together as far as their, their home team, right? That's true. And then the other thing, which is like my personal almost crusade, is making sure that people don't forget about that there's probate court when you die, but there's probate court when you're alive. And that's even more painful. It's called in California called a conservatorship other states call them guardianships but we call them conservatorships and i'm gonna guess that 90 percent of all trusts because i know my trusts don't fall apart when you don't die but you end up with dementia but most do and here's it's 
kind of silly why it does, but I pick on my mother-in-law because this really happened to my, my in-laws. They had a wonderful living trust. It would have been great if she just had the audacity, you know, died like she was supposed to, but she didn't die. She got dementia. And my father-in-law fell and broke his hip. And like everybody's trust, it says when, you know, if he dies or becomes incapacitated, she's in charge. It would have been great, except for she has dementia. He breaks his hip. He goes in for surgery. It was almost three months before um, he was able to, to talk clearly because the anesthesia affected his, his ability to talk for several months. So here we have her in charge. She could not even remember he was in the hospital and would, was going out looking for him and, at the night and the day she, he was in the first in the hospital when my sister mom picked him up he had been up the whole night looking for her husband from the bedroom to the kitchen that's what alzheimer's looks like but she was sure where we were going to steal from her so she wasn't going to resign her job now she's in charge of everything she can't remember anything now we have a problem and she won't resign and her trust requires two doctors to declare her incapacitated but she's not going to Go to a doctor because she's using the F word. And I always love saying the F word because everybody thinks of the other F word. The word that is the F word in my office is I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't need your help. I'm fine. You you, you guys, I don't have Alzheimer's. It's in your imagination. You're just trying to rip me off. In fact, you stole my money yesterday. You know, it wasn't my purse and you stole it. I know you've been stealing from me. Of course, you're not stealing from your mother. Right. But that causes a problem. Now she won't resign. You can't get her to go to a doctor because the doctor said she had Alzheimer's three years ago. That really happened. That was really the conversation. He, he didn't know what he was talking about, according to my mother-in-law. Now, her reality wasn't real. doesn't matter. doesn't matter that it wouldn't have taken, you know, anybody could have known she had Alzheimer's. It was very obvious. We still had to get two doctors to say it was true, to get her removed, or a court. So we had to go to court for my own mother-in-law. And... You know, that costs, you know, it can cost, you know, bundles. It can cost Absolutely. thousands of dollars if you, you know, if you have enough money and your family fights long enough, um, it can cost hundreds of thousands. I mean, the only case I've seen in the hundreds of thousands was the Casey Kasem case, which I got involved in. You know, he had lots of money and, and the court battle went on after his death for three more years and the bills were way up there that's not typical but even for my mother-in-law where we all agreed that she needed to have a conservator appointed if if i had charged them which i didn't i know what my fees would have been and it would have been easily uh, about 10 times of what i charge for any trust that i do even my most expensive most exotic trust so you know i i'm really on a crusade and people the look of their trust. Think about what happens if I don't die and I get dementia. You know, right. Uh, we need to plan for that. We need to make it easy for people to come in and help you. Um, I'm encouraging all my families to have that early diagnosis. Let's get your kids in early while you're still understanding you need a little bit of help before you've gone a little bit to the mid-stage where your mind is so confused you can't understand anything. Let's get them to be, you know, your co-trustee your backup trustee i call them junior trustees you're going to teach them what you do so that if you you know they can step in at the time comes and take over but meanwhile they're letting you be in charge and they're learning from you and that really works well so that you know you have that backup plan you don't have to worry about dementia or that sudden stroke um i had put that backup trustee for me my mother came up with the the term junior trustee actually put my my son in because he is a lot like my dad and she really wanted a man in charge and you know, she's from that generation so uh, he was a charge and she had the stroke um, he'd been she'd been teaching him what you know she had and getting his name on it and she couldn't even write her name and he was right there and was able to take over and still ask her what she wanted him to do And, you know, until her death, you know, he asked her what she wanted and was able to sign for her, you know, as her trustee, you know, and it worked so beautifully that, you know, I want that for everybody. I want everybody to be my mom. I don't want them to be my mother-in-law and have to take them to court. And so I, 
you know, have my story of my two moms. And I tell that a lot. I say, you know, you want to be, you know, my mom. You know, I was glad that I had learned to do that.